When compared to 35mm or medium format, large format photography has several things stacked against it. There are a number of barriers to entry and plenty of opportunities for things to go wrong. And disappointments often feel far worse. But the reward is certainly sweeter than what you get with smaller formats. Let's dig into it. Large format cameras are any camera that can shoot a negative of size 4x5 inches or higher. Most common formats start with the 4x5 and then 5x7 and 8x10. You might have seen large format cameras in movies, they're clunky, they're boxy and are instantly associated with the past. But the fact that this format or these cameras are still being used to produce incredible imagery is a testament to their capabilities. It's safe to say that large format images are a touch above the rest when it comes to not only image quality but also in giving you full control as a photographer. Before talking about buying decisions, benefits or disadvantages of large format, let's take a quick look at a large format camera and some of the parts involved uh, in using this camera. Let's use my Chamonix as an example here. It has a front and a back, which is called a front standard and a back standard. Front standard is where your lenses go and back standard is where you have the ground glass and you can add any accessories like film backs for smaller formats, reflex or folding viewer, uh, and your film holders when you're ready to take an image. This middle bit here is called the bellows. They're fully removable in some cameras and you normally have a rail at the bottom which has this mechanical movement done usually with the help of a focus wheel that allows you to focus your image. I bought a Chamonix 45 f2 late last year and I've taken a couple of dozen shots with it so far. To quickly talk about the specs and the type of movements it can do, it's coming in at 1.6 kilos or about 3.5 pounds so it's a decently lightweight camera for its size. Uh, and it folds really nicely to be able to hold it in this little bag that also comes with the camera. It takes a Linhoff style board uh, in the front. It can perform tilt, swivel, shift, rise and, and fall. And in the back it can do tilt, swing, push and pull. It is a really well built camera. That's something I've come to uh, experience and appreciate. I like all the zero point dots they've provided to be able to align the front standard or the back standard back to zero position after you've taken a shot or while setting up the camera itself. The tilt mechanism in the front has a mild click to it, which I quite like, so you know there's that feedback whether you've tilted it to sort of the next point or not. I also quite like that this tilt mechanism is controlled by a separate set of knobs instead of the ones used to do the rise or fall. Uh, the ground glass in the back is decently bright to view through and they've made it compatible with graph lock backs so you can shoot instant film or other smaller format film with it. Uh, the camera comes with what the company calls a universal bellow that goes from 52 millimeter to 395 millimeter length. You can also get red bellows instead of black if that's your thing. There are spirit levels on all sides of the wooden frame of this camera and I think that's a quite a valuable addition that comes in really handy while on the field while, it, while you're trying to get the camera level. So far I have zero complaints, just really impressed with the build quality and all the different movements that can be done with the camera. I've mainly only used tilt and rise in the front uh, but I'm sure as I use more and more of it, I will start using more different movements and I'll be sure to report back to you on that. We know that the large format negative sizes are larger than commonly used 135 or 120 formats. But just to get a, an idea of the actual size difference when it comes to different formats, here's a 35 millimeter negative Here's a, the smallest available 120 format, which is a 645 negative, and then the 6x7, which now compared to 35mm does look quite a bit larger. And now here's your smallest large format negative. So in terms of image quality, bigger turns out to be better. For the same ISO, bigger negative means smaller overall grain structure, sharper results, and captures more detail. And in printing terms, when you're blowing up a negative into a larger print, large format retains quite a bit of detail, 
when compared to smaller format, assuming you're printing them both on the same size paper. Now the large format look, because of the shallower depth of field for the same aperture value, does provide a unique rendering of space. So that is another point for bigger is better when it comes to image quality the aesthetics of it, at least in my opinion. Also, every lens behaves like a tilt shift lens because the front standard where your lens and the lens board are gonna be mounted can be used for rising and falling, can be tilted and can be swiveled and shifted. So your camera's plane of focus can be aligned to whatever you want it to, which is an incredible amount of flexibility to have. And this is the case in some large format cameras and some cameras even allow you to tilt and swivel and do different movements with the back standard as well. So again, a point towards bigger is better in terms of controlling the outcome of your image. For pretty much everything else, price point when it comes to film, when it comes to processing and scanning, ease of handling the camera, flexibility, uh, when it comes to capturing moments that uh, are fleeting, bigger is not better. It hurts your bank account, could be a source of frustration when you're trying to shoot something quickly. There is a learning curve that comes with this. I mean, you'll eventually fall into a rhythm, but to begin with, it could be quite a bit challenging. Unlike other formats where your equipment buying decision could be as simple as a body and a lens, or better yet, a point and shoot camera with inbuilt light meter, and you're done. Uh, with large format, you will have to make multiple decisions and probably multiple purchases. And there are things to consider before making those decisions. Uh, but on the flip side, there are a number of choices. Large format camera first, obviously the camera, the body itself, there are options in all different price points. I believe the cheapest new one you can buy is through a company called Intrepid Cameras. But if you'd like to buy used, uh, some good brands to look out for are Vista, Graflex, Horseman, Toyo, and Linhoff. Make sure to find out from the seller that the bellows have no light leaks, that the range is suitable for the kind of photography you would like to do, the range these bellows offer. I mean, normally you would need a different bellow for ultra wide angle photography or super telephoto photography. Uh, also make sure that all the movements that that camera is supposed to do are working as expected. And I think you're pretty much there. If you want to go the new 4x5 camera route, some of the manufacturers you can buy from new are Intrepid, like I mentioned, Ghibellini, Stenopaika, Linhoff, believe it or not, according to their website, they make made-to-order large format cameras. And of course, the Chamonix, which made the 45 f2 that I currently own. Lens and lens boards. This is arguably as important a decision as the camera itself, in my opinion, because your image quality, for the most part, is riding on the quality of your lens. Good news is there is quite a bit of variety in the large format lenses you can buy. For instance, Fujinon from Fuji, Nikkor from Nikon, Topcore, Toynon from Toyo, and Schneider lenses, to name a few. And they're all leaf shutter lenses, so the shutter is in your lens and not in your camera. A full frame equivalent focal length is something to consider while you're buying a lens. Plenty of online calculators available to find out the equivalent focal length. I'll leave a link for one in the description below so you can find out what works for you. When I bought the first lens for my Chamonix, I bought myself a 150mm Fujinon f5.6 lens, which covers about 40mm in focal length as a full frame equivalent, which is a good general purpose lens to have for portraits and for anything slightly wider. Another thing to consider while buying a lens is the lens's image circle. If you've not heard of this before, this is basically the diameter of the image that your lens is capable of projecting onto the film. The minimum diameter required for, to fully project onto a 4x5 sheet film is 153.7 millimeter. And I would recommend getting a lens that definitely does at least this much, if not quite a bit more, so that later on when you're more comfortable in taking large format images, you, if you wanna use different movements, you can do so without the lens casting, vignetting around your image. In terms of lens boards, every large format camera has a certain type of board they're compatible with, so when you're buying a lens, you need to make sure it's mounted to that specific type of board that's compatible with your large format camera. Alternatively, you can buy the lens board and the lens separately and put them together yourself. Lens boards sit on the camera's front standard and I found out recently that this diameter 
uh, also is something to consider the diameter of the opening in your front standard uh, because that's the hole through which your lens's rear element is going to go in. So if your lens, the diameter of the rear element is bigger than the diameter of your front standard, you're not going to be able to use that lens with your camera. Critical focus, right. This is an important step in being able to take a large format image because the framing and uh, composing and focusing, all of this happens on the ground glass, which is this big piece of glass uh, at the back of your camera. Obviously you can compose and frame, but to be able to nail focus on where you want to, you would need a magnifying loop that has at least five times magnification. Having said that, I bought myself a 4X a magnification loop because it was a good deal and it's fine in most cases, you know, especially if it's like close-up portraits, but I do regret not paying a bit extra and getting a good five or six times magnification loop. Um, so yeah, that's what I would recommend. Get at least a five times magnification loop to help with critical focus. Film holders, right. You need something to hold your sheet film in complete darkness until you decide to expose your film. Um, so because these are these, these negatives are huge, they are not like your roll films where the film come in a canister or in a roll that you can just take out and put in your camera in broad daylight even and not have to worry about exposing the entire film. For large format stuff, the sheets come as individual sheets. Usually film boxes have 10 sheets or 25 sheets or sometimes even 50 sheets and you need to take these sheets from the film boxes and put them into your film holders. Film holders usually hold two sheets of film, one on each side and you have a clear way of knowing which side is exposed and which side is not. This does rely on you uh, removing the dark slide while taking the photo and turning it and putting it back so that you know later on that that side was exposed. There are a number of brands in the market such as Toyo, Elite, Chamonix makes their own holders too and I'm sure there are a number of other brand names that I'm missing here. Uh, all you need to make sure while you're buying it online, especially if you're buying it used, is to make sure that the film holders do not have any light leaks. Shutter release cable. Usually these cameras do not have a shutter button so you need a shutter release cable that can attach to your leaf shutter lenses. I bought myself a Nikon AR3 shutter release cable used for like 15 bucks. This is supposed to be one of the better shutter release cables that were made. So I would say, yeah, if you can get that, do so, or any shutter release cable will do really. It's just that if you have a good quality cable, then you know, you're going to be putting it in your bag. It's probably going to be twisted and, you know, turned and whatnot. And you don't want it to fail on you while you're on the field. So just make sure your cable is good and it's in good condition. Also make sure to do test shutter firing just to make sure that everything's working properly before you expose the sheet. Changing bag, this isn't necessarily quote unquote needed um, if you have access to a completely dark room, but you do need a dark, completely dark space to put the film from your you know, film box onto the film holder. Uh, and then after exposing it to be able to take it out of the film holder and put it into either a developing tank or another box to send it off to be developed. Dark cloth, again, you don't need to buy a dark cloth that is specifically designed for this purpose. Anything that can shield the light while you're framing your image through the ground glass under the cloth should be fine. Black t-shirts, shirts, towels, I'm sure it'll all work just fine. Light meter, you probably, again, don't need to buy a dedicated light meter in most instances, but if you'll be shooting slide film or in conditions that require careful reading of light, or if you like to manipulate the exposure on the film, then it's probably better to have a dedicated light meter. I don't have a specific recommendation other than you'll benefit from having a good light meter just because the cost of every frame to shoot and develop is significantly higher than other smaller formats. You wouldn't want to be messing up frames because of bad light meter readings. I use a Pentax digital spot meter and I use zone system for pretty much all my exposures. Film. I'd recommend black and white film as a first pack for two reasons. One, you can buy some fairly economical black and white sheet film to practice like Foma Pan. Uh, and two, developing at home is way easier to do for black and white sheets than for color. Uh, keep in mind that initial setup costs might run you back by 
100 to 200 depending on how much you want to spend but you will recover that even before you've developed your first box of film um, and you'll have leftover chemicals to do more later on. I bought a pack of Ilford HP5 Plus 400 which has 25 sheets and I've also been developing all my sheet film at home and I've recently also started doing or developing color film uh, Kodak Portra 160 as well. We'll talk more about developing in part two of this video. Right, there might be slight variations in what we talk about in this section, but for the most part, the steps involved will be similar or the same. You know, you find a frame that you like, um, and then you set up your camera, put the lens board on the camera, open up the aperture, plug in your shutter release cable, now compose using the ground glass, focus using the magnifying loop so that you nail your critical focus, take your meter reading so you know which f-stop and shutter speed you want to use, set those shutter speed and f-stop on the lens, close the aperture, cock the leaf shutter, test the shutter by firing. This is just to make sure that your shutter release cable, your lens and everything's working fine. Cock the shutter again, now carefully put the film holder in uh, your back standard, remove the dark slide, press the shutter uh, on the shutter release cable. Now you've taken your first large format photo. Now you can turn this dark slide and put it back into the film holder. Your exposed sheet is protected from any more light hitting it. Take the film holder out, you're done. So on average, it takes a good five minutes at least from the time I see something I like to me pressing the shutter, sometimes more if I'm still figuring out compositions. A really helpful tool that I've come to use is this viewfinder app where you can take sample shots by inputting your negative size and your lens's focal length to see if it's something worth pursuing even before you're setting up your camera. I mean, this wouldn't simulate your lens's depth of field or anything like that, but it'll give you an idea of what the frame is gonna be like. Okay. That was quite a bit for one video. Feel free to rewatch separate sections if you need to. I've added chapter markers as always. Please feel free to share it with anybody you think would be interested in getting an overview of large format photography. This is part one. In part two, we'll talk about developing sheet film, both color and black and white, and scanning with a flatbed scanner. But that's it for this video. Thank you so much for giving me your time. Take care, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.